what do you think unity is? You know, how would you define it? I think that everyone who has spoken has said the important things about defining it. Um, I have a certain stubbornness within me that makes me not want to give up my um, independence. <laughs> so that might interfere with my wanting to be uh, unified. But uh, and this is going to be interesting for me. I, I'd like to paint a picture here. And um, just to give you some kind of, uh, of context to not necessarily agree with, but to put in your mix, okay, in terms of like how you're thinking about unity. So there are some species of jellyfish, okay? Now, it's important to think about jellyfish is that they're one of the oldest continuous organisms on the planet. They go back almost since the beginning of life, you know. Um, they are, they're really old. And one of the, the things that's unique about a certain grouping of these jellyfish in the sort of the box jellyfish realm is that each cell when it's born, it's almost like a clone but it uh, differentiates or specializes, changes itself, becomes different. Um, much like you have like a liver and you have a heart and you have uh, other organs and then the, all those cells kind of are alike. Well, these cells turn to be a whole jellyfish, but each jellyfish has a unique thing that it does, and you find them in one giant clump. None of those jellyfish can exist by themselves. One jellyfish, for example, will be uh, capturing food, but it can't digest it. It has to go another jellyfish digest it. And it's individual organisms. You can see it, you know, if, um, and each one of those jellyfish, some of them are uh, do mobility. They move things around, you know, they, they have all these different units, but none of them are individual, you mm -hmm. know, but they are unified in the sense that you see them and it looks like one giant jellyfish, you know, it looks like one giant colony or something like that, but on closer observation, they are individual units, okay? So sometimes that's what it seems like with humanity to me, is that each of us has some unique characteristics and none of us can exist by ourselves, you know? If, if, if we were, I would easily say that uh, you know how you have the you have these stories where there's the last person on the planet. That person's done. You know, <laughs> they 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 are the you know um, they'll probably have it the worst because they'll they may die slow unless they you know something happens and they're but they're done pretty much. You know, because uh, you know it's like you have those things. You, you'll have these shows where it's like Mad Max or something like that, where it's like the last outpost and stuff like that. And they're loading up their guns and they're doing things. And then they're smoking cigarettes. You say, look, you, you have to have a factory to smoke a filtered cigarette. You know, <laughs> did, did the end of the world for you come yesterday and you just had that last pack? Because that's not how it, how it happened. You say, oh, we have this one thing of gasoline. Doesn't matter if you have a tanker of gasoline, you know? How long can that tanker last? You know, unless you have production, nothing's going to happen. You know, whatever stuff you have, because, and in those movies, nobody's doing anything. You know, you don't see any production happening. You just see, you know, so I think sometimes people have it. They, 
I say that to say sometimes we forget how unified we are, even if we don't want to be. You know, there's, there's a certain connectedness. So I put that out there for you guys to respond to as a catalyst for conversation. Uh, your, your mic's not on, Lee. I would like to compare it to um, uh, human connections, whether it be marriages by whatever or best friends and things forth. It's a give and take. Mm. Okay. And if it's all give or all take, there has to be a balance somewhere in there. Uh, I have known couples and friends that are just opposite in personalities, and yet they're very close. So mm. they have evidently found something that makes them united, mm. some commonality of some sort of purpose, I guess. It might be even working in the community for a, I like what she said, a cause Mm. or a goal mm. or something, mm. uh, organizations, when you get together, you know, the unity produces such quality results mm. because you're all working toward the same goals, maybe in different ways. Mm. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyone else? Thoughts. When you were talking about unity, you know, especially with the jellyfish, um, that was a that was a good descriptor for me because I was thinking of unity as um, you know, there's unity in small units and there's unity in large units. So you know, there's a marriage or there's a friendship, like uh, like Lee said. But then there's East River and West River, mm -hmm. and then there's North and South Dakota, and then there's the United States. And then there's, you know, the world. Um, I think that the quantity of unity can be measured. In, in what way? How would you measure it? And how would you express the measurement? Uh, the only way I can express it is through those, through, through those examples, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unity of a marriage is, is two. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the unity of uh, East River and West River, um, boy, <laughs> it's it's difficult to describe. I guess I don't I don't know for sure, but um, you know we're different. We're different, but we are one state, and we have to find a way for everyone to work together and to elect people who are um, represent both of us. And uh, I I can't think of a better way to describe it. I'm sorry. No, that's that's okay. This is a this is a struggling thing, you know, um, and that's one of the things I hope to do here is to uh, brainstorm with everyone about, you know, we don't have to each it, no one of us or five of us have to have quote the right answer. I don't even know if there are right answers, but struggling with the answers will give us a better depth of what we think. That's why I like to talk to people that have completely different ideas than I do because it gives me a better depth of my own thinking. Whether I change my mind, and I do that often, or because after considering their point of view, I can see clear, not just whether mine is right or wrong, but in what context does my idea exist? So. Whatever people have to offer, I think is valuable in, in a discussion. So I, I've been struggling with um, the expression that we use or rather we have on our currency in different places, the pluribus unum, yeah, yeah. you know, out of many one. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to figure out one what. And I think <laughs> it just hit me uh, when it was described about, you know, South Dakota the different people of South Dakota as one people in South Dakota. But it also brings me to the thought that the United States has been described in a number of ways as being an experiment. Yeah. 
And I think it's an interesting experiment of out of the many, the creation of one. And so we're still very much in that particular experiment. I know a lot of people don't, don't really have that kind of thought about this being an experiment, but I, I do. I oftentimes think of us, can we pull this off? Mm. And I, I'm still very much in favor of saying, let's go forth, let's go forth, let's not abandon, even when times get tough, as of like last, last Wednesday, we still have to continue towards this one people uh, that may have, I don't know that we, we all have commonalities, but we have maybe a, a common purpose. I think that, that one is what resonated with me when it was put in the, in the discussion. Common purpose seems to be something that we can work with. Uh, as we create this one, this unum. Mm. But I, I, I don't know that everybody's ever really had a good discussion as we're trying to do right now about what is that e pluribus unum? What is that thing that comes after unum? <laughs> yeah, and th that's very interesting you should mention that, Alphonse, because a lot of the disagreements I think that we have is because we haven't looked under the hood and we, we haven't come to agreement. We have some flowery thing that we say or, or objective that we have, but we don't get under the hood with each other about, well, exactly what, what do you mean? I don't have to necessarily agree with you, but I do feel I need to know what you mean when you say that, you know, otherwise, am I even communicating with you or vice versa, you know? So that is a very good thing to decide, you know, like when we say, well, what, what do you mean when you, when you uh, say, we're unified. I will say that sometimes we're we're how do I say you're uh, you're a guy looking for fire with a with a with a lit match, you know, or something like that, you know, because um, we all we do have lots of stuff in common. In fact, most human beings are mostly doing and want the same things, you know. I mean, when you think about what you do all day. You know, first you sleep, you know, when you meet the person who is not sleeping, they're not happy. You know, that's not a good thing, right? We have to all eat, right? And we have pretty much the same nutritional needs in terms of carbohydrates, proteins, uh, and micronutrients. We, you know, it may vary from one person to another uh, and what they have available may vary from one person to another, but the needs, as human beings are pretty much the same, okay? Um, water, we need, we're mostly water and air. You take water and air out of us, there's not much left. Go down to the crematorium and you'll see, you know, there's, once they take that air and water out, you're pretty much, you know, just you know, a little bucket of stuff, you know? Uh, and that could be reduced, you know, because most of that is still air. You can see it when it fluffs around, you know, it's like lots of space between those things. So. Mostly what we are is the same, you know? So we do have the unity. The question is, what do we focus on? You know, we are, we have a lot in common. So I don't have anything in common with that person. Actually you do, you know? And that may be the problem that you all want the same things, you know? But you can negotiate that. So anyway, um, I have too much to say about this subject, but I'm more interested in what you have to say. So, uh, yeah, comments. I'd like to respond to the subject of e pluribus unum. Uh, it occurs to me that we have symbols and um, rituals in common that we've been taught since probably kindergarten, Pledge of Allegiance, National Anthem, which I still can't sing and don't want to anymore. Um, we take those things for granted and go on about our business, most of us, I think. I've never been in the military. I don't know what that experience might have done to make me more aware and realize why I was there. But so we go along and then something stirs us up like the Confederate flag. And suddenly that is hyper important. Uh, and just things like that. I think this is a really good subject to maybe have a 
even another conversation about e pluribus unum. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. like to add, um, I think it's a, a matter of respect. You talked about learning, um, Pledge of Allegiance and stuff like that, but I think respect for ourselves and for listening to other people. It's one of those things that sometimes we get into a conversation and we're thinking about what we're gonna say next to respond to that without actually taking in what people are listening to. Um, I know as I talk to people, both East River and West River, you know, there's a divide there, but yet if you can kind of look underneath, you know, as Lawrence said, we still have a lot of commonality there. We still need the, we breathe and we, we drink water and do all the same types of things. We just have different ways that we're coming at that. And I think when we can, when people can stop and take a little bit more time just to be able to, to really reflect on what other people are saying, that will help a lot as far as unification in the future. But um, I really think that, that listening to others uh, makes a big difference. Um, I had an instance when I was in college that I was in Montgomery, Alabama and selling books door to door. And one of the people I, that invited me to dinner um, in the middle of the, the dinner conversation um, went back in the back part of the house and came out with his Ku Klux Klan outfit. Um, as a high school or college kid from South Dakota at that time, it made my heart drop, but I was not aware enough of what that meant um, because, you know, segregation was over with, everything was fine in the South, you know, I, but I stopped and listened to what he had to say. And he was very, you know, very passionate about what he was, was doing. And it was kind of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. But that has made me all the more aware of how um, some people, you know, he, he, they were good people. They invited us to dinner. They, you know, had us, you know, we, we were strangers in a small town. They wanted us to be able to feel comfortable, but yet that was a huge divide between us. But I listened and learned from it and um, got back home safely that summer. That's amazing. Yes. And you're still alive to tell the story. That's right. <laughs> but, you know, you bring up a real interesting point, though, because sometimes people are put in a position that they feel like, well, if I don't, if I don't acquiesce or if I don't go along with things that is, to me is crazy, that somehow I'm destroying unity, you know? And that presupposes that you have to bend or one person has to bend more than the other has been, you know, you has mm -hmm. to bend. You could say that that person, for example, in the case that you just gave, Maybe that person should throw away their their clown outfit in order to get in in order to have unity, you know. So, because everybody has to have skin in the game, and if that person is saying, "Well, you have to do all the things that I need to do," that's kind of like if you're in a marriage and a person says, "It's my way or the highway," yeah. you know, then that's not really even if you stay, that's not real unity. You know, that's domination, but I don't know as unity because there's not a sense of everybody needs to get something and what are our basic needs. That's why I think we need some work is what are our basic needs? You know, what are the things that, can we identify the things that we all need? And if we can work toward that and realize that, okay, these other things are out there, but but do we know the needs of others? Do we know the needs of that clan's person? And I would say most of the time we don't, you know? It took me a, a long time and I'm still not clear on it, but it took me a long time to even listen to that. And then after you start listening, you realize, oh, um, I can see where this person feels threatened. I'm not saying they're threats, it's a real threat, but I can see how they feel. It's a threat. I can see how this person has an internal need that is not satisfied. And uh, there is a pain there and, and a sense of terror almost 
that somehow they're being diminished because they can't dominate. You know, there, there are some interesting things, but the more I listen to it, the more I think, hmm, how do we bring that person into the fold? Which brings me to how do we accomplish unity? What are, what are the ways that you would go about trying to create unity where there is division? And you can create any scenario you want because we can learn from all of them. I, uh, I was going to share something earlier, and I think it's kind of a nice segue into this question. And what Alphonse said really got me thinking. Um, I feel like the the pluribus thing is not not necessarily working these days, um, to to put it lightly, and and I I just wonder I don't know the answer to this, but if we reframed that that idea, um, would that change anything? Because it feels like there there's so many differences out there, like should we be shooting for the together we are one or should we be shooting for something that might close more closely fit the way our society is now let me just throw out a, a quick thing here just to sort of make a potential uh, context we can be unified about one thing and still disagree with it other things. We, we've said that, right? So it's possible to say, to focus on what is it that we have in common and always have that thing in the forefront of our mind, because it always depends. What you see is what you can pay attention to at that moment. The brain has this fluke that you can only be aware of one thing at a time. You can switch back and forth and stuff. But that creates a problem because when you're feeling something emotional about one thing, it's really hard to balance all the different things that actually make a difference to that thing you're thinking about, if, if you follow me, you know? So, uh, so it, 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 we can find benefit in knowing that there, where are the things that we always disagree, I mean, that we always agree on and always be able to come back to that to that point. Is, does that make any sense to anybody? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first of all, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think unity in my life's experience has to do with language. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first thing. When I meet somebody I don't even know, I listen to their accents. I listen to how they talk. I listen to what they're saying, of course. But here in South Dakota, let's just admit it. You have how many dialects of language just in South Dakota and Native American, uh, you know, or blacks or, you know, economics. I had to learn so many different ways to communicate, whether I'm in a cell bar or whether I'm in, no matter where I'm at in South Dakota, everybody, for the first 60 seconds of our conversation, everybody has their own personal accent. I don't know how many jobs I've lost getting out of service or got or obtained, I should say, because I'm from South Dakota and I'm talking to my future employer and in his mind, he's thinking I'm a white boy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I get to the job, they're looking for this white boy. And is Lynn Hart here? I've been sitting here for an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, so language immediate language people don't realize that language unifies people instantly or it will separate people instantly so that is a way that i've learned to immediately meet people get in with those so what happened we lost him Well, I don't know. That's too bad. Um, well, we'll carry on. Maybe he'll. Maybe he can 
hit another button and come back, <laughs> you know, because it's so easy to hit a button and you're gone, you know, here into the ether. <laughs> Lawrence, I'd like to sort of expand sure. on that a little bit, mm -hmm. um, kind of tying together your comments about people feeling threatened. Mm. And uh, I, I don't know who was speaking the last, but um, the way he could identify where people were at by their language. I have to share a story in my younger days I was a reporter for the New York Times, and I had to cover a Ku Klux Klan rally in Connecticut, mm. out in a corn or cow field in, in um, Eastern Connecticut. And it was one of the scarier moments of my entire life because the Klan was there in full regalia and they were, uh, the Grand Marshal was, or whatever he was, David Duke was in the middle screaming that he hated blacks and Jews and women who had uh, who were educated and had positions in the media. And I was standing with a, a group of reporters right in the middle of this, ringed by these Klansmen and some women in the shadows um, burning a cross. And the whole group was surrounded by an armed circle of Connecticut state policemen. And when he started, David Duke started ranting about the people that I was standing right next to, um, that was really scary. But one of the things that sort of came out in that encounter, even though it was very traumatic for me, was I heard over and over again from the Klan's people uh, who were mostly blue collar workers in Connecticut about how threatened they felt by people of color or different people intruding on what they felt was their trade or they felt economically threatened. And I think that once I understood that, although I could never support the agenda that was being presented, I only had to report on it, which was bad enough, but at least I understood a little better where these people were coming from and what was really driving their fervor and their passion. So I think any attempt at unity, you have to understand where that person is at. Uh, and I, you know, I, I still think that there's a great divide between members of the Ku Klux Klan and maybe the rest of us. <laughs> But I think if we understand where they're coming from, it gives us a way to think about how you can approach them and perhaps at least have a conversation that is no, so, not so impassioned and full of empty rhetoric. You know, you make some really good points, Bart, really good points. And it's, it's useful to, to realize that people have fears for their survival all the time. You could be in the jungle and you still have fears for your survival because you're always, you know, uh, there are always environmental resistances. So, you know, and you want to stay alive, but you're going to die. So that's a dilemma. What happens is some people take advantage of that and manipulate other people, you know? So you take, for example, the person who's who's afraid that they're going to lose their job. Well, once you have a sense that, hey, look, we all have to eat and you know, like, how, how do I help you? And then we can do this job together and maybe there isn't enough work for, it, for everybody, but we can all have something. And if you're short on sugar, just come over to my house, sugar. You know, we got, we got sugar too. You know, when you have that kind of feeling for each other, then you can have unity. But as long as I can make you think that it's a zero sum game, if I get anything, it means it was at your expense. Because you, if you are made to feel like you should have everything and you should have certain privileges because that's, that's the way it's always been and that's the way God wanted it or some, whatever, you know, whatever rhetoric people use then you're going to have a sense of loss. The human mind does not like to deal with loss. We have a loss aversion loop psychologically. 
we don't like to even things we don't need you know that's why we can't lose weight you know, because we really don't <laughs> <laughs> you know, we want it, you know, uh, at least that's my excuse. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, like, or you'll have people who are in a bad relationship and they should want that person to leave, but they'll beg them to stay, you know? So it's, it, we don't like loss. So when anything shifts and we feel that all that is lost, we have a sense that everything is falling apart when most of the time, you know, yeah. And I have many stories about uh, loss aversion and how it's an illusion. But today we're talking about unity. <laughs> so any other ideas? When you talk about loss, I I'm, think to the times when there's um, a flood or a hurricane or something like that, and people come together that normally wouldn't be you know, doing things, you know, the people that have all the money in town, you know, their houses are impacted, but yet the, the people that have nothing and they're renting, they're also impacted and they're generally out there working together. So the adversity brings you together because you can see that you have a common need to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think is something that, you know, adversity is something that can draw us together and kind of put, have us put aside some of those misconceptions we have about other people. Mm -hmm. So very true, so very true. And there's all kinds of interesting experiments that demonstrate that. And should we have more time, I can tell you some of the more interesting ones, but, but there are a number of different ones and they don't even have to be calamities. They can also be just things that you do together, like one, experiment where people just played air guitar together and their and and they their um, autonomic nervous system which was off the chart measured by the way not just sort of somebody observed it it was actually measured with with uh, uh, meters that measure that kind of stuff uh, went back to normal once they played air guitar together you know and I actually talked to the guy who did that experiment, and we had a long conversation about, about what that took and why it worked, you know? So we know that that's a thing, okay? So that's one way to do unity is to do stuff together, just the practice, not the conversation, it's the practice. So can you, can you give some examples, anyone else give examples of something that we could do or that could happen that could make it possible just to have a conversation and to see each other in some other light other than our disagreements. Okay, I'm gonna throw something in that I hope is not bringing down the intellectual level of the conversation <laughs> because I'm gonna refer to an 80s pop song. <laughs> um, and uh, I, was, I was thinking, especially when we were talking about, you know, how we're mostly water and air and all of that kind of thing. I was thinking of the song Russians by Sting that was released in the 80s. And the choral line that repeats is, uh, if the Russians love their children too. And there's even a line in there that's something about we share the same biology regardless of ideology, which, mm -hmm. you know, again, like I said, mm -hmm. I'm all pop culture right now, with that one. but but I do find that idea. Don't the Russians love their children too? You know, this was in the the waning days of the Cold War. Um, that general idea is kind of helpful when I'm trying to talk with someone who, um, who with whom I disagree. Um, you know, and politically is the best example. But the idea being, okay, you know, kind of like. Um, Barbara was talking about the threats that some of the members of the KKK felt. Mm -hmm. I feel like people, even in their different political uh, lanes, will say, I'm concerned about the, the world I'm bringing my children into. And mm -hmm. so therefore, I think we need to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm also concerned about the world that I'm sending my child into. And, but therefore, I think I need to do a different thing. Mm -hmm. If we can go back to that and say, okay, where does it start? It starts with wanting to make our world a better place in most cases. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it starts with saying, I'm afraid that this is going away, or I'm afraid that this is not going to be good for the people I love. Mm. So just trying to kind of trying to see behind what the people are saying to mm. what their fears or concerns or loves are. Mm. Kind of helpful. So true. So true. You know, and and let's see if we can get under the hood of how would we do that? What are some kind of ways that we can make people feel that they want to do it? Because humans are feeling beings that think, not thinking beings that feel, you know? We, we feel first and then the brain sort of pops in somewhere. So how do we make people feel connected? And I'll tell you how in this country, we made people feel disconnected. There were concerted efforts to segregate people, to create barriers, barriers that did not exist, you know, that we think are some kind of natural barriers. Now, those, those barriers didn't exist before between people, you know, um, but people made barriers by saying, oh, this is, and they still do it. They'll say, okay, we want, we'll sell to these kind of people on this side of the track and only these kind of people on the other side of the track. The common phrase was redlining. And our government took part in that, right? To create barriers between people where they didn't need to be, you know? So how would we, what kind of things might we do to encourage people to feel different about us and others? I think I like the idea of you bringing actions into our discussions. So discussions can lead to actions. And having said that, I think we have a quote, fear of stepping on somebody's toes because they have differing opinions. You were wanting to avoid losing a friend maybe, or something like that, or a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so if there's some actions that we could do with your question, mm -hmm. and what you're doing right now is a big one. Mm -hmm. If you can get a group that is willing to be listening, and I'd say try to keep the, the group in this kind of a size. Mm -hmm. And think about discussing this. The second thing I think it was it's very evident that we have to realize that human nature is we look for likenesses. We feel comfortable. It's getting out of our comfort. Zone. Mm. It's to put forth your own first step toward doing that and questioning in the type of questions and how you ask those questions rather than being combative like, oh, where, where could I find that? And where did you get that in from me? Where can I find that to look? So it, it isn't like, where did you read that? You know, think of how you say it. Think of your timing. And it's not going to be easy. There are so many divisions. I remember growing up, uh, I was the only person from that was Scottish descent and I wasn't Scandinavian. And um, yes, I felt ostracized. Mm -hmm. And of course I just crawled in a hole, <laughs> but I think those divisions are there. Having said that, I've kind of tried this a little bit in this last year, a little bit more than usual, because I will talk to anybody on the street, anybody, anywhere. And I've been felt guilty that I was crying, but I really do like to know where people come from. Mm. I like to know what their feelings are, their family, what they're doing, da-da-da-da. 
And I found that opens a lot of doors. Mm. Mm. If you're not doing it in a questioning way that's prying. <laughs> yes, Lawrence, I think many of us uh, have read, uh, I know we've mentioned the book before about how not to be a racist, I forget the, the correct title. But one of the chapters that I, I'm sure that several of you have read that book. Uh, one of the chapters that was really of interest to me was is that the author uh, devoted a whole chapter about when his crusade for justice and equality uh, sort of came apart. And he analyzed why that happened. And what he sort of decided was is that he had been so strident and so combative in presenting his views that that really turned people off. Mm. So I think Lee was really on to something when she says there's a, a, a right, thanks Jennifer, uh, there's a, a, a right way to, to present your point of view mm. so that you can keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's challenging it goes back to something that was said, you know, almost at the beginning of this, is that you can feel when you're saying, okay, I'm making concessions, but the other person rolls up on you and they're not making any concessions. So there's a ratchet effect that you're putting in the, the energy and you want to say, okay, I, I'm listening to you. But at some point, you don't feel like you're being listen to right and i think that that creates a deterrent you know uh but i'm looking for a way to get around that you know i'm looking for a way to to make that other person interested and one way of course is to feel like they're listened to but often that's not enough you know so i'm that's where i get back to what's our practice you know, what are the, there are lots of, we have a lot of mind control things that we do all the time that we're unaware of, you know, like smiling, you know, smiling is, it, most psychologists will tell you that's our number one mind control thing because the brain is programmed to respond to a smile, even when you don't want to, you know, mm -hmm. so there are things like that, that we can learn um, for another show, but uh it's, I think it's important to find ways, things that we can do. Um, so any other, any other ideas? Yeah, Lawrence, I, I guess I'm talking a lot today, uh, but I, I think that you're correct that sometimes the conversation does stall and what do you do? And I think that you need to sort of step back mm -hmm. and reassess mm -hmm. um, you know, how things are going. I just finished reading, God forbid, Trey Gowdy's book on that's what it's called. It's called It Doesn't Hurt to Ask. Mm. And it's not really, even though Trey Gowdy has a very specific political point of view, he writes the book from the perspective of a lawyer and a prosecutor who's appearing before a judge and a jury mm. trying to convince people of, uh, of an action they should take. And uh, he, he basically talks about how that process works, how you can use well-formed and well-phrased questions to sort of get the conversation back to a productive manner. Mm -hmm. um, he, I really enjoyed the book because um, this process can be full of pitfalls. And he uh, cites some very humorous mistakes about he made and sort of the devastating effect it had and what he did to sort of recoup and recover mm. uh, his argument and his uh, method of persuading a jury to do and to listen to what he was saying to them. So. If you can, and I promise the book is not a political book, even though Trey Gowdy could yeah. be kind of political, but the, the, the book <laughs> is, is really a good book. My, my brother is a judge, 
Mm. And he teaches uh, law classes. Mm. And I sent him the book um, mm. because he's training lawyers. But it was really kind of a good read. It doesn't take very long. And it sort of has helped me. I don't always do well at it. But sort of when I'm in a situation where maybe things aren't being communicated real well, the mm. best thing to do is to ask a question. But yeah. be careful of the way you ask the question, because it can have devastating effect if you don't. Yeah. You know, you, that's a very good point. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good point, Bob, because one of the things we lack is the ability to ask good questions. And even though we say, oh, it's important to listen to people, they can say a lot of stuff that you're not interested in. So you have to be able to ask a question to get to what, you know, the thing that you want to know about them, the thing that would help you to, in this case, get to, to know them better and to understand them better. Um, but that said, people don't always know why they feel the way they do, you know? So even though we ask a question, I think it's more than just phrasing the question, you know? I think it's more positioning the person so that they want to tell us stuff, you know? And that's where I think the action comes in. That's where I think like making that person feel like you're on the same side of the table and you even have the handkerchief when they want to cry, you know? It's like making people feel like you're interested in them beyond just saying I'm interested in you or what you have to say, you know? What are the things that we do? What is the tone in our voice? Um, and I don't know that we can like orchestrate that. I think we have to feel it first. And if we feel that, you know, uh, this person is completely nuts, but okay, you know, so am I in some way, you know? So we, at least we have that in common, you know, we're both nuts. So, you know, so you can feel relaxed with them, even though you know they're like clans people, you know? And I do, I do that often, you know? I'm sitting with people, I know that this, this guy has no use for me in his ideology. But given the circumstances and the situation we're in, uh, like his cars broke down and there's, and, there's, uh, and there's a snowstorm, his whole attitude changes. <laughs> you know, but I would still help that person, you know. So um, we're, we're coming up now on our, the end of our time, we're going to uh, cut off today at uh, 1130. Um, are we going to try to keep it to an hour because a lot of people, I think, have things that they want to do. Um, so we're, we're going to end this in another hour. Is there anything that anyone else feels like they would like to contribute before we, we close. Yeah, Lawrence, um, I apologize. I think I, my phone died or something, <laughs> but I was just trying to say that, uh, yeah, it, language, uh, it's basic. And I don't know what you guys talked about. I just got back on, but uh, I just want to tell everybody, uh, thanks for uh, putting in your two cents. I've enjoyed listening and you're an awesome guy, Lawrence. I really like you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. I agree. Lawrence is cool, but Barb got cojones, boy. <laughs> you guys really have to read. You really have to read Trey Gowdy's book. It's it's really. He doesn't talk about Benghazi except for about two pages at the very end. Hmm. Uh, but it's it, it's a really good book, and uh, it sort of uh, starts you thinking about ways that you can interact with people that maybe you don't agree with uh, and how you can bring them along. I mean, he speaks as an, uh, as a, from his experience as a prosecutor with hostile juries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if he can convince 12 people of something that might be a little controversial, I think the man probably has something to say. So I recommend the book highly. Yeah. The These one are thing that I wanted to say <clears throat> briefly, and I will be brief, um, 
the the movie Color Purple where um, Oprah Winfrey was playing What's Your Face, and the woman brought her to meet with her family and then she couldn't drive back and so Oprah Winfrey had to drive her back and miss out on the family reunion and so on and so forth. That was the first thing that I was going to say and I did say it but if everybody is talking about being unified and bringing unity to the table they need to check their ego they need to check their ego at the door. They need to check some of their feelings at the door because no one walks in the stream twice at the same time of having that water be the same. And everybody will do things that, or people will do things. And we saw that and we won't go into whatever last week because I was toe up. Mm -hmm. um, but people will do things based on what they're, psychological needs are and their comfort and if in fact someone says well this and that and it makes you uncomfortable that might be a little bit of your ego so you check your ego at the door that's what we had to do when we raised 17 foster kids they were department of correction boys and they had a set image that they had to be macho they had to do all of these things and basically, I, I told him, I said, there is no ego here. Me and my husband don't have the ego, but we will check you. <laughs> check yourself before you wreck yourself. And if you can get that balance in there, then, then there can be unity because we have conversation all the time. And they were some pretty rough boys. Mm. But yeah, check it. Check yeah. your ego. Mm. That's it. All right. Well, we're, we're uh, wrapping up now. Uh, I want uh, to thank all of you for, for uh, joining us. And I will encourage you to keep this conversation going, at least with yourself, you know, defining what you think is unity and how you might contribute to the unity that you want to see. And defining the unity, not just let's say for you, but like, how does it work for everyone? That's a kind of a, a, a reflective question. Like, how does it work for me? And how does it work for the other part? How does it work for the we, you know? So uh, there are a few books out there. I think one of them was put in the uh, chat. So make sure uh, down at the right-hand corner, you can uh, re you can save the chat. There's three little dots there. If you click on the dot, uh, uh, you know you can save the chat, and then you know you can go back and if there were references or, or uh, uh, um, URLs or links or something, you can go to those. You can find those. It'll save it onto your computer. If you don't see it on your your desktop when you do that, look in your downloads folder. Sometimes depending on how you have your computer set up, it might be there or a document, one of those. So uh, Ryan, you wanna say something about next week? <clears throat> yes, next week we'll be discussing uh, precision in language. Okay. Okay. So I hope you all come back and join us. Yeah, that should be a very interesting conversation and think about what you think precision and languages do is that a thing for you is that important to you uh and whose yeah. language anybody's language <laughs> any language whatever yeah. just precision in it like do you want to be precise or is it you know um is it more important to just be vague or just think about that subject you know and then when we come back we will we'll talk about that All right. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Same time, same station. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.